Hello everyone out there in the multiverse. I am Dan. And I'm Andrea, and we own Multiverse Comics in Culpeper, Virginia. Besides doing that, however, I'm also a teacher. And uh, obviously, because we live in Virginia, schools have been closed for a couple weeks, and it looks like we are not going to be resuming school for the rest of the school year, which is very frustrating. And so, what we have opted to do, at least my school, uh, my county, we have been putting lesson plans and pacing guides and having um, you know uh, Google Meet and things like that. So we are still communicating with our students. We're still providing um, uh, learning for them to the best of our ability. And so that made me think a little bit about something that we've actually been talking about for a while. Uh, you know that I am a huge proponent of comics as literature. As far as I'm concerned, the same themes that you're going to see in anything that your English teacher uh, assigns to you, you can find in a comic. Not all of them are great, but there are some really good stories in these. And so uh, what made me think about this at first was um, The Walking Dead. So when The Walking Dead was um, just beginning to be on the TV, like first, second, third season or so, I would actually um, use elements from the show to talk about character development. Like as far as I'm concerned, Carl sitting on top of the roof eating chocolate pudding is the epitome of the coming of age moment. Like that is an image of coming of age as far as I'm concerned. Um, Superman, even though I hate this particular trope, but uh, Jonathan Kent dying is a trope that you will see in Superman where the coming of age part of it is you know him learning to be a man or, or coming into his own as a man is his father dying and him sort of taking on the mantle of, of being the man in his own right. Again, overused, very stupid, but it exists. And so if you're you know, exploring that particular trope, it's there. So I have actually used comics to teach um, literary uh, elements in my class. I'll, I'll, not everyone, of course, was watching The Walking Dead at the time, but I had a really pretty good chunk of students that were watching it. So I was able to say, remember when this happened last week? Well, this is what that is. Um, I mentioned how the character of the governor, um, way back when, uh, they gave him that whole backstory so that when he died, we cared. And so we talked a little bit about the writers using uh, character development to make us sympathetic with the characters so that the event of the plot was that much more impactful. I could wax poetic on, on that. But I, what we've done uh, is we've looked at different literary tropes that come up often. You know, These are the ones that, not tropes necessarily, but, but topics and themes that, that appear all the time in literature. And we've narrowed it down to seven that we want to talk about. And I'm going to talk about, um, you know, a story that I have taught you on that topic. And then you're going to talk about a, we're going to talk about a comic book that, that kind of does that same thing. So the first one I want to talk about is character motivation. So character motivation is when you, you have to think about why the character is doing what they're doing. Because on the surface, it seems so easy to say, oh, well, they're doing it because they're good or they're doing it because they're bad but that's not really how it works. And so one um, story that I focus on for character motivation is the play The Crucible by Arthur Miller. But what is a comic that focuses on character motivation? Like you're, you're forced to take what you think you know and, and redo it. I don't know. Fables. <laughs> yeah, right there. <laughs> So what the writers of Fables have done is very similar to the author Gregory Maguire uh, when he started writing books that were about well-known fairy tale characters but kind of turning them on their head. And one of the most well-known would be Wicked, uh, which became a musical for heaven's sake. Mm -hmm. um, but it's talking about, and you have to think about why the characters are doing what they're doing. And Fables does a really good job of taking these characters that you think you know and, and kind of turning them on their head. And so you can't just say, oh, well, Snow White is doing that because she's Snow White. No, you have to think about what's behind what she's doing, and, and, and sometimes you aren't able to even um, see what's going on, or you can kind of put the pieces together. And so Fables is really good for character motivation. So uh, if you missed out on reading The Crucible and you need practice on discerning character mo motivation, uh, pick up a copy of Fables and read that and look for character motivation. The second um, trope that I've kind of already mentioned that I teach often is coming of age. Uh, there's a story uh, by Doris Lessing that I teach called Through the Tunnel. If you have not read it, you should read it. 
Um, it's it's actually it's a slow moving story, but very compelling. I really enjoy teaching it. Uh, but it's it's dealing with coming of age. You you have a um, a tunnel that is a literal literal symbol for um, the journey from childhood to adulthood. And uh, the comic that we chose, since you're going to be all snarky about it, the <laughs> try to make him part of the conversation, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> Why is this coming of age, dear? That is uh, Batgirl Year One. Um, of course, Barbara Gordon. Commissioner's daughter, she's uh, probably 19, 20 mm -hmm. in this. Um, so new adult. New adult. Um, she actually wants to follow in her father's footprints and, you know, become a cop. And Commissioner Gordon's like, no, my daughter's not becoming a cop. Um, she actually just puts on a female version of Batman costume for a Halloween cost, uh, party. Um, <clears throat> the... Uh, killer moth attacks for whatever reason. Because it's Halloween. Uh, yeah, something like that. And um, she ends up taking him out by herself. Um, no special gadgets or anything like that. And throughout the course of the story, she basically has to prove herself. She gets help with Robin that supplies her with some equipment and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So, As Robin has a crush on her. He's younger. At this. He, he's like a teenager and she's like older and as a shipper very awesome cute crush the that, whole relationship mm. of barbara gordon dick grayson batman it just don't get me started i hate it it's so gross in all respects like I, she should not just stop that, that it. that's purely animated series there is no um there's no mm. relationship like thing the animated barbara series is canon as far batman. as i'm concerned but whatever <clears throat> yeah it's just it's just weird yes that is not a comic thing. That is a Bruce Tim thing. Okay. I love Bruce Tim, but no. Bruce Bruce Wayne, in this, does not want her to do. Although, it's, I think he didn't I, her. it's been a while since I've read this. I do believe that he is aware of Robin supplying her stuff mm -hmm. and doesn't stop him. Yeah. Like, doesn't attempt to stop him. So I think this is like one of his manipulations. Maybe he does want her to. Or whatever, you know. That's one of the things. It's been a while since I read it, but yeah. It's, and hey, it's like you mentioned reader. earlier, also mm -hmm. character motivation. And let's face it, any and good comic, any good story, is not going to focus on one particular theme. Uh, you're going to have a lot um, uh, pre present. This one, of right. course, we're using and, for coming of age. And since we are talking coming of age, this is actually, in a way, the second part of a trilogy that's mm -hmm. a coming of age of Dick Grayson. The first one is Robin Year One. Mm -hmm. He plays a role in this one, and then it ends with Nightwing Year right. One, where of course he's stepping out of Batman's shadow. But the feminist Nothing in me wanted to focus on yeah, Barbara. Mm -hmm. um, I will say this too. I'm going to pause here because I can already hear my literary critics freaking out at me. Themes and topics are two totally different things. A theme is a statement about a topic. A topic is usually one or two words, and so what I'm actually talking about are topics, but. In, in general layman's terms, most people don't understand what I mean when I use the term topic uh, instead of theme. And so a theme is a statement about the topic. I'm talking about topics, but I'm going to continue talking about, I'm going to continue calling them themes just for general understanding. So let me make that very, very clear. Uh, if it's one or two words, it's a topic. If it's a statement about the topic, it's a theme. So this is going to be about coming of age. Walking Dead has... has um, has something about coming of age. Two very different themes, two different statements, same topic. I'll stop being a geek now. Continuing right, on. Let's move on. Come on. <laughs> Number three, unreliable narrator. Now, this is one of my favorite themes because one of my favorite authors is Edgar Allan Poe. And um, most, if not all, of his narrators are completely and totally unreliable. And we were kind of stumped with this one as far as uh, what would be the, the comparable story um, the story that I use to teach an unreliable narrator would be The Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe. Again, if you have not read this, oh my goodness, what is wrong with you? Read it. Um, Stop insulting our viewers. You're right. Yeah. Actually, not even what is wrong with you. Like, who has not given you this gem of a story to read? We have failed you. I'm sorry. Please read. You will enjoy it, uh, I hope. But, um, a couple of years ago you were reading Superior Spider-Man, and uh, talk a little bit about Superior Spider-Man. What is it? Uh, Superior Spider-Man is, it, it starts with uh, 
uh, dying Dr. Octopus. Mm -hmm. Basically, Dr. Octopus is a character that has no powers, and he's been hit in the head way too many times. So it's kind of like, you know, Spider-Man, he's, he's gonna, he, you know, kind of killed him over the long haul or whatever. So slowly killing him by bashing his head in once in a while. Yeah, it's because, you know, he, his comics, they hit each other. Um, so, uh, Oc did some kind of device to be able to switch bodies with Peter. This is a, a very old trope for comics, you know, the villain switching bodies with the hero. But the thing is, it's usually like one or two issues. Um, this one, you know, Peter died in Otto's body. Mm -hmm. And so Otto became Spider-Man. And the reason that I chose this uh, to be the unreliable narrator is... As a comic book reader, you have this idea of Spider-Man. So even just looking at this costume, you have some preconceived notions of how Peter's going to react and what his motivations are going to be. We know Peter's motivations, for the most part, behind what he does. But Otto Octavius, is he has very different motivations. And Also, the, you sure. do see the cover here. You can obviously see that's something that doesn't look like Peter. No. It's a good thing because you've got the, hey, that's Peter, but would he be in that pose at all? That's not, that's, that's not something. So you're constantly questioning, uh, and again, it kind of goes back to character motivation, but also Otto's not going to tell you, even as the reader, uh, what his motivations are. Sometimes they're revealed later and it turns out to be something kind of sinister, if not quite sinister, if not absolutely sinister. Sinister, but he is trying to be good, too. That's he is the trying. Thing. You're absolutely correct. That's the thing. He, he, it's, it's the classic thing of doing the wrong thing for the good, right? Otto... The ends uh, justify the means. Yeah, exactly. Otto will do the wrong thing, but for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. But that this. still makes him an unreliable narrator. So that is why I chose him to, uh, or chose this particular series for unreliable narrator because you can't really trust Otto, yes. and because he's wearing the Spider-Man suit, the suit that we know and love to be Peter Parker, it makes it even harder for us to remember. Oh wait, I can't trust this guy. It, it lures you in. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, Superior Spider-Man. Next, satire. Uh, one of the more well-known satire uh, satirists is uh, Jonathan Swift. You probably know Gulliver's Travels, also a modest proposal. Um, if uh, if you're a senior in, in this county, you will read a modest proposal. Uh, if you somehow missed out on that or you want to get a head start, it's a great read. It's a short story. It's a great read. A modest proposal, satire. Satire, of course, is um, poking fun at something about society in order to try to produce change. And so... When I mentioned satire to Dan, uh, the first one that he thought of, of course, was... Simple. And look, and look, no, you change. <laughs> I didn't notice the dialogue on there when I picked the cover, so it's, it's interesting. Oh, just, yeah. So Deadpool is, yes, satire uh, is a great satire. Um, and so, I, I mean, goodness, if you're not reading Deadpool, it, please do. It'll change your world. It'll make you happy. So, satire, a modest proposal, Deadpool. Um, what do I have next? Revenge. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say that I was kind of debating whether or not to put Edgar Allan Poe in this category as well, because, you know, again, the Cask of Amontillado, uh, the Telltale Heart, all revenge stories. Um, but uh, I, I left him with re Unreliable Narrator. And so for Revenge, I actually have a couple. Um, first of all, there's a short story called The Interlopers, which is all about revenge. And uh, these two men pontificating about, you know, why they're going to kill each other in the middle of the woods, stolen land, etc. Also, a lot of Shakespeare um, has revenge. Hamlet, um, for example. Uh, a lot of the Shakespeare tragedies will, will, be, will have revenge show up at some point. Uh, and so when uh, we were thinking about the comic version of the revenge theme, we thought, of course, of... Punisher. Why is this a revenge story? Well, because his family dies. Uh, all of them gunned down, and he has a one-man war on criminals. Just all of them. He, he just... The thing about the Punisher is he is not a hero. He will help out yeah. someone if they need it, but he is about punishing. Mm -hmm. He he embodies the revenge trope yeah. because 
that is his mission just to kill as many of crime bosses as he can yeah. you know and he goes for big stakes he's not picking off the little yeah exactly the 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 um the underlings yeah, he's he going cut, for the crime he cuts bosses. also ten, head like recent series he just killed zemo baron zemo well apparently if something else happens so baron zemo's not really dead but everyone thought that's yeah, comics yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the point is he went after baron zemo um, usually, that's not a Punisher thing because, you know, hey, he goes after mob bosses. But in that one, he went after Baron Zemo. And, sure. Yeah. Um, next, Misunderstood Monster. Now, the obvious uh, choice, the literary choice, literature choice for Misunderstood Monster would be Frankenstein. Um, there's this great saying that says, uh, knowledge is understanding that Frankenstein is not the monster. Wisdom is understanding that Frankenstein is the monster. And um, what made me think of this, this whole un misunderstood monster, say what you will about the Fantastic Four movie, not the most recent one, but the, the original one um, with Jessica Alba and Chris Evans and other people whose names I forget, Michael Chiklis. Um, one thing that I really liked about that movie, there, there were some things to like, bear with me, but one thing that I did like is the focus that they gave to the thing and how Ben had to deal with continuing to be a hero or, or, be, or being a hero when he hated what he had become. He was monstrous. Mm -hmm. And one reason that I really appreciated that is because that was kind of Stan Lee's whole point. He took a monster and made him a hero. He, he purposefully took a monster and made him a hero. That was, that was the point behind Fantastic Four or, or one of the points behind Fantastic mm -hmm. Four. And so I really appreciate how you have this misunderstood monster in the form of, of Ben. And so uh, for this particular theme, we have Grim Noir. Now, is this a one-shot? It's a one-shot, yes. It's a one-shot. Yeah. Uh, but honestly, Focusing anything... Focusing on Ben, of course, yes. Yeah, but honestly, anything with Fantastic Four, uh, especially um, the recent wedding shenanigans. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I, I, I yeah. really do love it. Read it to get that joke. There you the go. Read it, yeah. recent series, now you have but, to. Yeah. Um, so the Fantastic Four misunderstood monster is the parallel to Frankenstein. And then finally we have Fate versus Free Will. Now this is uh, basically any Shakespeare play, or at least the tragedies, they deal with Fate versus Free Will. Now if you read the Shakespeare, you will see that uh, the theme of the Shakespeare um, Fate versus Free Will was usually that fate, no matter how hard you fought against it, would always win out. In fact, uh, Julius Caesar has the line from which John Green got a book title, The Fault in Our Stars, where um, Cassius, who is talking to Brutus, trying to convince him to kill Caesar, basically says, uh, the, the fault is not in our stars, but in ourselves. And what he means by that is, if we're not getting what we want, it's because we're not taking it. It's not because of some, uh, you know, fate or a fatalistic thing that is happening beyond our control. We control our own lives. And Cassius is proven horribly wrong <laughs> with that. So the, the overall idea is that fate is in control and free will is just a, an illusion. However, in Batman and Son, uh, they flip that, or yeah, the writers kind of flip that. They allow Damien to exercise free will and kind of come out on top because of that. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean... Um, this is the first arc introducing Damien, so of course the story's not there. He doesn't actually become Robin here. He doesn't actually um, go against his fate completely, but he is... He, he For those of you that don't know about Damien, um, he is the son of Talia and Bruce Wayne. And, and more specifically, the grandson of, of Ra's al, Ghul. Ra's al Ghul. And he has been trained from birth to take over leadership of the League of Assassins. Okay. Um, so, um, that is his fate. What he ultimately cho chooses is to follow Batman. And, um, you know, justice not vengeance. Just, <laughs> That's yeah. why I was grinning. Cause I was <laughs> justice not vengeance, justice not vengeance, justice not vengeance. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, Again, read it to that is joke. a perfect example of fate versus free will. Yeah. So, 
So as you are trying to continue your studies and trying to continue uh, exploring these literary um, devices that honestly are so very important, uh, reading and reading anything as, as far as I'm concerned, um, will enhance your life one way or the other, either because you're honing your tastes or, be, or beginning to recognize what's in the 10% of Sturgeon's Law and what's in the 90%, uh, you know, whatever, read. But if you're looking for specific things that you can even go back to your English teacher next year and say, hey, I read a book that was all about this particular theme and here's what it said about it, you have some things to think about. You don't have to say it was Damien and Bruce Wayne. You could just get, <laughs> well, there was this father and son and the father had been raised, or the son had been raised and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you, know? you can tell them the whole story and then end it with, yeah, it was bad. <laughs> and they'll be like, well, uh, <laughs> Please tell us how that goes because yeah, I'm please. excited about that. But, uh... Happy reading, guys, and uh, please do not forget to like and subscribe, and we, we will see, see you in the multiverse. multiverse.